Hello again. Uh, this is my third live stream podcast. I will uh, copy the replay of this onto my YouTube channel at the Great Johannes. And uh, well, let's start with a toast. You know, uh, cheers to the juice. Oh, that's so ethnocentric. I wish our people could be a bit more ethnocentric. But I think us European Thai people, despite our various strengths, there's something we don't have. We are nowhere near as narcissistic enough to even desire to uh, uh, take charge of the media narratives. And I think that is how the world is being ruled, isn't it? It's all media narratives. If you look at the conflict in the, the Middle East nowadays, by the way, I can't really be too specific because I really don't know how how aggressive the uh, the TikTok AI censorship is. I found out that TikTok uses AI censorship to read your words. Basically, they transcribe your voice into text. And then based on the keywords you're using or the sentiment of what you've said, they can decide to uh, uh, lock you down or block you or report report your content. It's, it's highly automated. So instead of saying Isra, I'm going to say Izzy. And instead of uh, saying Pala, I'm going to say Pali. So I'm going to talk about the Izzy Pali conflict for a moment. But in this episode, I will mainly discuss uh, some broader concepts of history and civilization. And that's quite a challenge. Even uh, Henry Kissinger, the American emperor, really, the overlord of the US empire, he, uh, he wrote a thesis once about the meaning of history. And uh, he couldn't figure it out. So let's let's try that somewhere halfway through this t talk. I should be discussing uh, a bit Spengler, a bit of Toyn B, and some others. But but let's start with this with what's in the news. You know the uh, the Israel um, the Izzy Pali conflict. Like it's a total media show. That's for one. And they've been preparing for this for a very long time. This isn't an incident. This is simply one more step in the greater Third World War, as you might call it, or rather the conflict between the, well, media-dominated West and the East, which is, you know, China, Russia, Iran, and so on and so forth. And uh, what, I, what I personally noticed in just the last few days is that some people I was following, like other influencers that I was following, they're coming out as hardcore Zionists such as libs for uh, libs of TikTok. Libs of TikTok is a, it's a Twitter X account where this woman exposed a lot of the freakishly weirdness going on in the LGBT scene. And she pops out as a Zionist. And basically everybody in the so-called dark web, deep web, these deep minds around Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubin, uh, you name them. I can't even name them. Uh, uh, you know... Uh, these people, they're all, all of them are Zionists. So the whole right-wing conservative movement has been captured by pro-Zionist presentators, influencers, that click. And that, that is a bit weird because this is the position of most, you know, European type men, white men. They, they are conservative, but now they're going to be sent to war for easy, right? we never get to fight for our own interests. And that's so strange. Uh, why are we fighting wars for other nations who get to have their own ethno state, who get to have their own purity concept and their race laws, but we can't even say anything about mass immigration coming to Europe because Europe is used as a dumping ground, right? Uh, imagine this easy pally conflict blowing up. Where are where are the two million Pali people are going to go? They're going to go to Europe again. We have to absorb them. And then what's next? They already said that, uh, I think Netanyahu already publicly said that, uh, that Iran was behind it. Iran, by the way, I don't know what the name of the leader there is. Is it Khamenei or Khomeini? This guy, he already denied that Iran had any involvement in it. And of course, in the West, we say, oh, they're just backtracking. They're afraid, blah, blah, blah. If they were afraid, the, the whole attack wouldn't have happened. Now, imagine how this attack, the Izzy Pali conflict, how it started, right? Just a few days ago. 
how did these weapons get to Gaza? Gaza is a, is a strip of land surrounded by Izzy, right? The sea is controlled by Izzy. Nothing goes in and out. So either NGOs are supplying the Gaza people, the Pali people with weapons, or these weapons are being smuggled into Israel and then on through a tunnel system into Gaza. Do you really believe that? You don't think that Israel is he, completely controls the Gaza Strip. So how did these weapons get there? Right. This is quite unbelievable. I read a newspaper article in the Netherlands where they whip up the story about these magical, mythical tunnel systems. Right. You'd have to have a tunnel dug from Gaza all the way to Iran to actually do that. And you don't think such such tunnels don't exist, but other tunnels that abs that obviously emerge on Israeli territory, Israel controls all of them. It sounds like like a stage, like a setup. In the in the 1940s, the Germans sometimes had German soldiers dress up as Polish soldiers, and then shoot uh, shoot Germans, and then claim that Poland had attacked them. Right. So so that's what this is. It's, it's a bit of a, a bit of a a weird scam, really. And so I, I think I already clarified in one of my videos on TikTok is that I don't pick, pick a side here. My, I'm with Europe. I'm for Europe. I'm for the advancement of our people and our civilization, our culture. Right. But I'm not at all interested in getting dragged down into this massive conflict that will be the, the, uh, the step up to a third world war. And then what? Right. And then we're going to send one, two, three, four, five million European men and millions of uh, American men, Canadian men, British men. Australian man, basically our man, to die while we are still flooding our countries with mass immigration coming in. Why would we do that? Why would we go along with this? You know, the United States has also made this massive uh, big mistake when they started promoting the U.S. Army as a safe haven for the LGBT people. Now, in, as, a, as a result of that campaign, Nobody wants to join the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army is having trouble drafting men into the army. So they're going to probably do a draft, like meaning a uh, compulsory draft. They will draft you. You have to do it. But how many of how many people are really going to do that? Only the really the, the stupidest people, right? The people with no future. Anybody who has anything going for them at all isn't going to fight in any wars for the U.S. government anymore or for NATO or for or for Izzy in the Middle East. Nobody's going to do this. <laughs> so welcome the first people are joining the chat already i've got my chat on screen but i'm trying to do a little talk here and i think i will uh i will respond to uh to uh what you're saying at some point uh so i see this whole easy conflict as a, yet another front in the bigger war between west and east or really the war between the u.s anglo-american empire and the rest of the world and it's funny to see that in this conflict, from the U.S. perspective, when they look at either Germany or Iran, they see two nations of about similar value. You see, the German economy was supplying Russia with a lot of profits over the energy supply. So they blew up Nord Stream. Iran is supplying China with a lot of oil, supplying the Chinese industry. So they're going to blow up the oil refineries. The American Senator Lindsey Graham said they were going to blow up Iranian oil refineries because they blame Israel for being behind, uh, blame Iran for being behind the Izzy Pali conflict. And so they did the same thing with 9-11, remember? After 9-11, the Twin Tower attacks in uh, 2001 or so, they first blamed the Taliban or the Afghani people or the Saudi, whoever. They blamed all sorts of people. And then eventually they said, oh, but Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. And then they invaded Iraq to destroy the oil or take the oil. This time they're just going to blow up the oil to basically to cripple China. <clears throat> no. And so there's a third front. So you got Ukraine. Ukraine was lost, by the way. Russia basically took the eastern part of Ukraine, the, one, the part they wanted, the Donbass region. That war is kind of dwindling down already. So they shift the attention to the Izzy Pali conflict because now Iran, right? And there was a third front, one of the France's colonies called Niger in the northwestern Africa. There's a country called Niger. 
and they um they broke loose i think the wagner group under the influence of the russians managed to do a coup there or something anyway the west is quickly rapidly losing power in africa african nations are siding with china and with russia and not with america and the united states is having quite some trouble staying in charge there as does uh, as does france and france has still still has a tremendous financial control over like 14 african nations french-speaking nations in northwestern africa right it's france's secret empire i spoke about this uh in another live live stream but here you see these three fronts ukraine israel and niger and those aren't going to be the only fronts there's going to be several other fronts uh, taiwan for example taiwan is next and then you know australian men will have to fight for taiwan u.s navy marines will have to fight china uh, Europeans will have to fight Russia and Iran, and we'll have to go to Israel. Uh, Britain already sent some uh, warships to, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea to help protect uh, Israel, so we're already involved. NATO is already, is already involved, just openly involved. And so this is all turning out to be a global war, right? And so what is so strange is the ethnocentrists over there in the Middle East, they couldn't care less about a guy like me. They think 500 guys like me are worth barely one of theirs. That's their math, the uh, easy math, you know. And why would American soldiers care to fight this fight? Do they really think we are just cattle, that they can just send us off to war and have us killed off, you know? And I think... Imagine you truly believe you are a master race. I, by the way, I don't believe white people are a master race, which is people. People who have survived this far, who have basically been responsible for 98% of civilizational developments, of inventions, of culture, of research and science. So we've done so much. But like, like Goethe's Faust, we've burnt ourselves out, right? There's a catch, right? You get all these gifts to produce modern civilization. Uh, you're going to have to pay for it in some form, right? Uh, and I think, you know, Gaza has no meaning. It's just a prison. It's being surrounded by Israel. The people living there are prisoners. The thing was all orchestrated and used as a springboard for going after Iran, really. It's quite sad, you know. And I think the real geostrategic importance of Izzy itself is that Izzy Israel is a sort of NATO outpost or used to be the outpost of the British Empire from where they could launch attacks precisely on Iran. And Australia, in this sense, is an outpost to launch attacks against China. It's interesting to see how these big geopolitical wars have been playing out for centuries. And that is the one thing that I never really understood about our ruling classes. They are actually capable of planning ahead several centuries, making strategic choices in the very long term, right? As though the world were a giant chessboard, but the games we play last for a thousand years. And the end game, of course, is uh, global dominance. The United States used to be the world's only superpower, but it's dwindling. Is China going to take over, yes or no? Or are China and the USA going to destroy each other in the fight? And will a third party, such as India, perhaps emerge as a new superpower? Or is it going to be Europe with new alliances? Say, if uh, the United States drops away, maybe maybe Europe can ally itself with, you know, the white Russians. Who knows? Because I just thought of this today. White Russians are quite poor. They have been living in poverty for a long time. They're just as poor as, say, West Africans, right? And, but they see other white people who kind of look like them, even though you know some people are Slavic, some people are Germanic, but they kind of look like us. And they see us in the West of Europe having a lot of wealth. They see us in North America having a lot of wealth, but they don't have it. They are still tremendously motivated to fight wars against Europe because they know they're going to get the wealth especially if they would capture Western Germany, the German industry, they would have tremendous wealth for themselves, right? So they are extremely motivated to fight, whereas we in the West, having already had all this wealth, right, we are no longer motivated. Some fatigue has crept in. We've become lazy. 
I think only 10% of Dutch men is willing to fight for their country. And now, now that I think of it, why would you want to fight for a country that is basically hosting, you know, mass, mass, mass immigration? Your replacement immigration is coming in. You're being depopulated. Your demographics are dying. What's there to fight for? We don't have something new. And I'm going to talk about this. If this all comes to an end, you know, are we going to start over somewhere else with with the motivated few, say 5%, 10%, 20% of people may may still be motivated. And maybe maybe we have to start over somewhere else. Right. So I read about this that um, through the so Israel is near the Suez Channel, which is goes through Egypt. But if you knew that about 30% of global containers, shipping containers go pass through this channel, 12% of global trade passes through it. This is very important for Europe and for Britain to make a lot of money. This is how we trade, right? Because this is how we trade with the East, with China and so on. A lot of stuff just goes through the Suez Channel. You needed an outpost in the Mediterranean Sea that was on NATO's side. So in case other actors would take take control of the Suez Channel, take control of our shipping uh, passageway, basically, uh, even though it goes through Egypt, uh, you need a partner there that you can rely on to uh, safeguard our economic wealth. And I think that's the real purpose of Israel geostrategically. Uh, it is an outpost to protect the Suez Channel's, uh, uh, the Suez Channel's uh, shipping routes, shipping lanes, at the same time also serve as a springboard to attack Iran in the bigger game of, of the war games that we are facing now, right? Uh, the global war. But the, uh, the waning economic might of Germany, uh, especially since the implosion or the, the sabotage of Nord Stream by the USA, I don't mind saying that it, the USA did it. They want to pin this on Ukraine and say that Ukraine did it because they can't be seen doing things, right? Uh, this is one way of how the US empire works. They do a lot of things, but they don't want to be seen doing it. Uh, it's an old adagio. And so uh, if the German industry collapses, it may harm you know, the wealth in Western Europe. We simply may not be able to afford our defenses at some point. If, in my view, if the German economy does die, I think Israel will go along with it. I think these two are tied. The economy of Germany and Israel are, are tied together some way. And I personally, admittedly, have never really understood the connection between the USA and Israel. Uh, other than that, there are a lot of U.S. senators with dual citizenship. But beyond that, beyond this ethnic connection, what is really the geopolitical interest between the U.S. and Israel? Well, you know, using Israel as an outpost to wage war on the world, just like you might use Australia and New Zealand to wage war on Taiwan or on China. These are just outposts. And I think Ukraine, in this sense, is also a sort of outpost. Ukraine isn't part of NATO, but uh, Ukraine is that buffer between Russia and Europe between your European market and the Russian potential aggressors who want to take the European economy because they're motivated to take it. I'm not saying that, you know, from my point of view as a European, uh, the way the US is behaving toward Europe nowadays doesn't make them any better than the way Russia is treating us. So I don't see them as I don't see the US as our saviors anymore, especially when you have a president like Joe Biden today on MSN.com. Did you see the article? It says Joe Biden apparently said that, oh, in a distant future, white people will cease to exist. They won't be, they will go extinct. He really spoke. So while they're genociding a bunch of people in Gaza, they're just, you know, casually speaking of, or casually referencing the genocide of our people as well. I don't believe that. I don't fear this at all. I don't fear that the, uh, replacement immigration will really replace us because we got this far. There's something about our people, right, that helped us get this far. I don't quite know what it is yet. What is it that when we, this can't be the first time that we are stuck in this kind of predicament, this kind of situation, right, where we have threats from all sides. We have a food supply chain threats. We have economic threats, strategic threats. The Gaza is a threat. The U.S. is increasingly treating us as though we are the enemy. Russia is also seeing us as territory they wish to conquer. We have no allies, no friends. But we came this far. This isn't the first time. How did we survive all these these tens of thousands of years that our people have been, you know, basically dominating the civilizational field? Uh, I suppose in the coming few years, 
next five years. So we're going to discover something about our people. We're going to find some kind of spirit that unites us in, in, in a sort of collective resolve, collective action against all these troubles coming at us. Uh, I think we're going to see some, some pretty, some, some fireworks. We're going to see fireworks, you know. So, hey, so somebody says that both Palestine and Israel are enemies. Yeah, well, that's how I see it. Yeah, the conflict is like a, uh, a fire. It's a fire hazard. And what do you do when, when your neighbor's shed is on fire? You put it out. You don't wonder if the dogs or the cats set fire to it. You put out the fire. And that's how, how we should treat the easy pally conflict. We should just put out the fire, you know. Uh, I think, yeah, I am Dutch. And so, uh, and although now the Western world is switching to green energy, right? I think in part this is because Iran has a lot of oil. Saudis are willing to sell their oil to China. Russia is willing to sell its oil to China. China is buying a lot of this oil to fuel its economy. China has access to the seas, to the Taiwan Strait, for which like 60% of global trade flows. And so you see that China is still running on oil and coal. They're still opening new coal mines and, and they're just burning oil at will. They're also going electric. But the West is betting on electric as the one and only solution, right? We have to go uh, have wind and solar and renewable energy. Because if we were successfully able to switch to renewable energy and thereby thereby make us make ourselves independent from the oil in Iran and the oil in uh, the oil in Saudi and the, and the Russian oil and so on and gas and so on, okay, I get that. I understand our need to be energetically independent. Europe should be, in my view, energy self-sufficient. We're not, but we should be. I have no idea how to do it. Maybe Norway has a lot of oil, but I don't know if it's enough. It's probably very expensive to get the Norwegian oil out of the seabed. Either way, I get the point that we need to be energy self-sufficient, but the Western powers are betting on renewables so that they can then bomb the Iranian oil refineries, right? Because if you can just, instead of taking the oil, you can simply strike from the air and be done with it. You can destroy the Russian refineries as well. You can destroy the Saudi refineries if you really wanted to. And thereby, what you're doing is you're simply preventing the East, you're preventing China and its allies from having an, an advanced civilization while perhaps in the West we may continue. Uh, and thereby, you would also force a lot of the, of the Eastern peoples to start reducing their population size by uh, drastically. Although, and I'll talk about this later, the energy footprint per capita in India, for example, is extremely low compared to that of Europe. I don't know what, what the difference is, but I suspect Europeans are using 50 times as much energy. A European is using 50 times as much energy as a person from India in India, right? And, and that may be our, our bottleneck. The true bottleneck is that the Western Europeans and the North Americans are, have, been, have grown so used, used to using so much energy and so much electricity and so much power, uh, we will have a hard time continuing doing this if we were first to cut, say, our energy consumption by 95% per capita, for example, right? Well, yeah, so, you know, Western, Western Russia here, somebody says Russia is Europe. Well, Western Russia is obviously in Europe. It's part of the European continent, what we consider the European continent. And the Northwest Russians, they have like 110 million people there who are white people. A lot of them look like us anyway. They have blondes there. They have, I think overall, they are Slavic people, of course. And I think I can see the difference between West European Germanic types or Celtic types and the Slavic types. They look a bit different, right? They clearly look a bit more Eastern, right? But I would still consider them, you know, white people. <clears throat> Yeah, what do you think about the 2030 agenda? You know, these are all ideologies. These people who rule us, the World Economic Forum and so on, they are ideologists who paint pictures of the future. And then they simply use the media and their, and their economic means to try to get people to believe these things. It's all words to them. To them, it's, the reality is based on words. I believe also in something called practical limitations and practical action. I don't think they will meet the 2030 goals. You think by 2030, nobody will be driving a car. Nobody will be eating meat in the West. People will revolt now. People are going to finally fight. I mean, you can starve people only from, from healthy, healthy 
pro healthy protein only so much before I'm starting to stutter because, you know, I'm a Dutch person. I can't speak English. So healthy animal protein is what makes people's bodies big and grow big. I mean, if you would start starving the Northwest Europeans from their protein, I think hell will break loose. You've got hundreds of millions of men here who are not going to give up eating meat. Come on. Uh, that's right. I don't believe the 2030 agenda can be uh, implemented, not successfully, not in practice. Maybe, and then they'll postpone it to 2050, and then they'll, oh, by 2100, right? They'll keep pushing for it for a long time unless we change the leadership, right? Whoever these globalist leaders are, you know, they're doing all of this in their own self-interest. They, their group, their clique, their class is a self-interested group. And the rest of us are just too individualistic, too atomized, right? At, at best, we care about our families, our friends, and our colleagues. But very, very few people in Europe and North America would pick up arms to fight for a white person living 100 miles away, right? We wouldn't even do that. Um, that's a problem. We, we have no, we are not ethnocentric, which is funny because they always keep calling us the racists. But we're not. We're not ethnocentric people. We are we are too individualistic and by far not as narcissistic. So yeah, Jordan Peterson, he eats only meat, yeah. Weirdo. Raw meat. Only steak, right? Okay. I think that's strange. I think his daughter slept with Andrew Tate anyway. Think about that. The guy is a Muslim and he hates he hates women. And then you would associate yourself with him. Okay. So uh, during this podcast, this live stream, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about history and civilization, these really big concepts. And it really starts with our grasp of what time is. If you imagine that history is a, is a series of events passing, passing through time and space, you have to wonder what is time and what is space, right? So others have written about this, and it goes back uh, all the way to Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, for a long time, even since the Bible, if you read the Bible, what is the time concept in the Bible? Well, it's linear. This happens, then that happens, then that happens, then this kingdom falls, then that kingdom rises, and then this kingdom falls, and that kingdom rises. The Old Testament is a series of events. It reads a bit like a soap opera with a a hook at the end of every episode, which will make you want to learn more about the next story, right? And so this concept of time as something quite linear where things keep progressing toward the arrival of a Messiah, all right? Um, that linear concept from a creation event, mind you, in the Bible, Genesis says God created the universe, which means it has a starting point, it has a beginning. Nietzsche breaks with this idea and says, well, what if it's not like that? What if time isn't linear from a starting point from time is zero, T is zero to infinity, all right? And we're always progressing towards something. What if time is cyclical? And Nietzsche comes up with this idea. He says he was hiking in the, in the mountains of Switzerland, echoing his mind with the mountains, echoing his thoughts with the mountains. And then he came up with the idea that uh, of the eternal recurrence or also called the eternal return of the same. Uh, to explain it, Nietzsche believed that it was possible that the life you are living right now may be repeated an infinite number of times into the future. Meaning that everything you do will be done forever. And that is a very different concept from the linear time concept that we are used. Even um, so the Bible is quite linear. Uh, evolutionary Darwinism is linear. It says we started out as amoebae and a plankton in a pool of mud, and then we evolved into humans and then beyond, and we will become gods one day. That is a linear concept. The scientific worldview is a linear concept. It believes we are progressing and we are discovering. Soon we will have the theory of everything. Then we will know exactly how the universe works, right? And also Marxism is also linear. Marxism's principle is based on this belief that... Everything in existence in the universe is matter in motion, progressing, accelerating toward utopia. And the only reason we haven't reached utopia yet is because of fascists and Nazis. And Nietzsche then comes up with an alternative to the idea of linear time by saying, well, what if time is cyclical? Der ewige Wiederkehr des Gleichen. Uh, in English here, the word same can also mean 
same as in something equal. It doesn't have to be identical. But Nietzsche believed apparently that the life he had lived would be repeated an infinite number of times. And so he felt the burden to make sure that he made the right choices and the right decisions every day. So apparently he did believe in free will. But I myself find it hard to believe that the life I'm living will be repeated an infinite, infinite number of times over and over. What if it's not quite like that? What if, uh, like in a theater show, you repeat the same play, but it's played with different actors, it's played with a diff before a different audience, and it's played with you know, a different setting in a different place? And the director and the composers, they each make different changes that they add to the script, to the screenplay. And over time, the screenplay changes so that it's not uh, the return of the same, but the return of something similar in a similar form, but still quite different. Personally, when it comes to uh, grasping the concept of time, uh, I tend to look at uh, Heraclitus' idea of panta rei. Everything flows, everything is always changing. Nietzsche also said that he believed that the laws of uh, the laws of physics are constantly evolving. And that is something I will probably believe, that there are no fixed constants and no, uh, no immutable laws of physics. It's not a machine. We are not living in a, in a giant apparatus that only works in a certain way. But that the laws themselves and the constants themselves are changing and uh, uh, evolving. So the idea of the eternal return, as posited by Nietzsche, constitutes a break with the linear progressive past of, of both evolutionary and biblical thinking and scientific thinking and Marxist thinking. Uh, <clears throat> but, and also these, uh, these three big movements of time, like the idea of Genesis, the idea of evolution, the idea of scientific pro progress, all say that the future is going to be better and the past was worse. We were worse off, right? Actually, in the Bible, they say that the past was better. So it's, it's always like, you know, do you know why progressive liberals always say that uh, the 1950s weren't so good? Because right wingers, conservatives say the 1950s were great and we should go back to the 1950s. The progressives say, oh, you want to go back to the 1950s? So you want to go back to the 1930s? You want to be evil, right? How you see the past right, informs your thinking about the future. If you believe the past was better, if life was better in the 80s, and you don't believe that things are progressive and progressing and improving, it forces you, you know, it's very different than from believing that the past was worse and the future is always better. If you believe the future is always better, that's when you believe that, say, the LGBT movement is progress. That's when you believe that diversity is progress. That's when you believe that replacement immigration is progress. And that's just so strange. Uh, as a progressive liberal, if you declare yourself a politically progressive person, you have to believe that all the things that are collapsing and dying all around you are somehow still evidence of progress. You have to believe that when 20% of U.S. teenagers under age 18 or so identify on the LGBT spectrum, you have to believe that this is progress, right? And that's so strange. One day the Messiah will come and the perfect man will be born. But what if we aren't flawed? What if there's nothing wrong with us? What if we can just stay the way we are? If you believe people are no good, you're going to want to try to change us. You want to change our behavior. You want to change our, um, our genetic makeup. You want to maybe mix us together. If you believe that humanity has broken apart into separate races, you may also believe that it's your job to fuse them back together by miscegenating them all. What if you, right? So this is the difference between left-wing thinking and right-wing thinking. The right-wingers say, well, you know, the races are what they are. They're different, but it's not like humanity is broken and we have to melt them all together. We can just stay who we are. We just each go our own way. We go separate ways. Some people are better at some things and other people are better at other things, you know. Now I'm going to quote something from the, uh, from a member of the Frankfurt School, this, this hard Marxist school. Uh, they started this in Germany. These are the people uh, who also started the Institute of Sexology, where they started experimenting with transgenderism in the 1920s. They started uh, doing freaky things to German men, trying to make them into women. Uh, and you know what happened next. People didn't like it. So 
Eric Fromm, I'm going to quote from Eric Fromm because he captures the spirit of the progressive belief in progress, right? And so Eric Fromm, I'm uh, quoting, The evolution of man in all history is characterized by man's struggle with nature. At one point in history, man will have developed the productive sources of nature to such an extent that the antagonism between man and nature can be eventually solved. All this point, at this point, the prehistory of man will come to a close and truly human history will ultimately begin. So Eric Fromm and these, these hard progressive thinkers, they all see our present time is flawed. We have to get to a point. We haven't even begun our history, they say. We have to get to a point where we become the perfect people who are finally able to live real lives. <clears throat> right? But Friedrich Nietzsche, as I said, he breaks with this idea of linear progress towards something by stating that everything always returns to the same. Uh, and that's how I get to discussing um, Oswald Spengler. So Oswald Spengler adopts this idea of Nietzsche, of the eternal return. And Oswald Spengler applies that idea, the philosophical idea of cyclical time, to civilizations and history. And Spengler believes that civilizations, first of all, are carried by races of people, and that these races have a birth time, uh, a high time, and a time of decline. We would now be living in a time of decline. Did you know that on the timelines that Oswald, Oswald Spengler gave us, around this time, 20, 20, 30 or so, he expected uh, American or European civilization to turn into a true empire again, where, we, we, where people would uh, relinquish democracy and welcome back in authoritarian rule by a strong man willing to rule at all costs. I need a sip for a moment. So Spengler believed that Western civilization wouldn't die yet. In his own timeline that he made uh, 100 years ago, he believed that our civilization was going to survive to around the year 2200. So we still have like 100 and, uh, 170 years left in his timeline, if he's right about this. And we are going to see the collapse, the, the decline stage of the Western civilization, where the West turns into a true empire, a ruthless authoritarian empire ruled by strong men. And you know what? I think it might happen. Uh, but Spengler, a few people know this, but have you actually read the book Der Untergang des Abendlandes? The, uh, the Decline of the West, as it's translated into English. This massive tome, he spends a couple of chapters discussing the very meaning of time and space. He asks the question, you know, if history is a series of events passing through time and, and space, then what is time and what is space, right? And so Spengler, as I said, takes on the Nietzschean idea of cyclical time. Uh, and here I found, I have a quote from Oswald Spengler, is that in his book, Man and Technics, or in German, Mensch und Technik, Oswald Spengler attacks the very idea of progress. So he doesn't believe that we are progressing toward a better future, the, making the world a better place. He doesn't believe this is happening at all. So I'm going to try to... <clears throat> I'll quote him here. The progress Philistine waxed lyrical. Oh, wait. The progress, the progress Philistine waxed lyrical over every knob that set an apparatus in motion for the supposed sparing of human labor. In place of the honest religion of earlier times, there was a shallow enthusiasm. There was a shallow enthusiasm for the achievements of humanity, by which nothing more was meant than progress in the techniques of labor saving and amusement making. And that way, that's where, that's where we are now. See, what is technology used for? It's used largely for entertainment and for saving labor, right? When you buy your uh, girlfriend a new microwave so she doesn't have to cook for you anymore, that's technology. It's to save labor, especially women's labor, so that women are free to do uh, you know, TikTok, TikTok live streams and do dances, right, for gifts. <laughs> oh, somebody sent me four roses. Oh, thank you for the rose. Thank you for the rose. Have you seen that? It's horrible. Of the soul, <coughs> of the soul, of the soul, not one word. We don't speak about our spiritual lives anymore. We have become so absorbed, infatuated with technology, our spiritual lives have, have taken a backseat. 
right? This progress was the great catchword of the last century. Men saw history before them like a street on which, bravely and ever forward, marched mankind. But where to? And from where? And for how long? And then what? It was a little ridiculous, this march on infinity, toward a goal which men did not seriously think about or clearly figured to themselves or really dared to envisage, envisage, for a goal is an end. Oh, there are women watching my stream. Do you know that um, the TikTok statistics, they can show me, uh, I think 81% of the people who watch my videos are men. I have 90% female viewers. <laughs> so, have you heard progressive liberals accuse... Uh, conservative people of needing closure. We are closed-minded and we always need closure. That is because they are open-minded, right? They believe in openness, open borders, right? That's them, the open society. And the, the, the problem here is that um, uh, closure also means a sort of definiteness. We want to know what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, where are we going to go, where is it going to end? But progressive liberals don't want to tell you where they're going. Because by defining the goal they are trying to reach, you make it definite, you make it come to an end. Um, this is why leftists think in terms of ideologized, idealized uh, ideas like diversity, inclusion, uh, you know, multiculturalism. These are like concepts, like very open, abstract, subjective concepts. They don't want to make anything concrete because by making something concrete, that would be the end and they don't want they don't like the idea of the end progressives really are people marching down the street to nowhere they just keep on marching and marching and marching and marching and they will keep telling you that they're making progress and whenever you ask them well excuse me where are we going they will punish you and say shut up you can't ask us where we're going fascist you nazi we're we're, we're making progress shut up and walk shut up and march you know that's what they are uh, I'm in Western Europe. My time is 8.41 p.m. I start my show at 8 p.m. UTC plus 2 every Thursday. At least that's the plan from now on. <clears throat> so, Spengler, and this is interesting, though Spengler believed in the, in the birth stage of a civilization, the heyday and the, and the decline, we are now in the decline, Spengler believed that Western civilization might be the first one to jump its shadow and continue existing for far longer than others have ever done. I don't know about that. We can't predict the future. I see another possibility is that when Western civilization, or if it collapses, we use the energy of it to reboot our civilization elsewhere or some other way uh, by using the 10 or 5% of people who are willing to start over. And so from Nietzsche, we go to Spengler, and from Spengler, we arrive at Martin Heidegger. The philosopher Heidegger has read the Der Untergang des Abendlandes, the, uh, the Decline of the West, right? And Spengler, Spengler cares, uh, no, wait. So Martin Heidegger is actually deeply influenced by Spengler. Uh, he also continues asking these questions, like what is time, what is space, and what is motion? in a philosophical manner, and Martin Heidegger successfully, in my view, attacks the whole notion, the Marxist notion of progress by explaining that Marxism, Marxism's assumptions of everything is matter in motion toward something, is they assume that time is linear and they do not provide evidence for it. Neither does the scientific community. Science doesn't know what time is. Ask science what time is. Is time, is time a molecule? Is time a particle? Is time a dimension? They don't know what it is because time is very likely a mental quality outside of the physical reality. The, the, very, exist, the very existence of time proves that there is something more than just the physical world. We are not just bodies in motion. We are spirits. We are souls. We have a free will. All right? And so Heidegger, like Spengler, opposed the belief... Uh, that technology could bring salvation. It can only, technology can only turn the earth, he believed, into a giant gas station, exploited to the brim, and then 
people cease to think for themselves. Martin Heidegger was more afraid of young people who no longer know how to think for themselves than of the atom bomb. He didn't fear the atom bomb. He said, the atom bomb, we will survive the atom bomb. But what we won't survive is when people turn into NPCs and, and exactly, and they stop thinking. So I'm going to try to speak. I've been speaking for 45 minutes already, mind you, by the way. Um, I'm going to skip over a part that I wanted to talk about because it's a bit too much. So I've been talking to you about, uh, you know, his, the, the meaning of history and time and space. And why does this all matter? Because we need to know. We should at least figure out whether or not whether or not our time is cyclical. Is our civilization really involved in the, in the birth stage, a heyday and a decline? And are we really in a decline? And if so, does that mean we should prepare for the end? If we know the end is coming, if we know Western civilization is going to collapse due to all sorts of reasons, uh, I'll go into that in a bit, then, then shouldn't we prepare for it? Shouldn't we get rally the people who are willing to, to think ahead, to make that jump, to, to, to leap over our shadow, right? And to figure out whether or not we can start with uh, a new motivation, a new vision, a new future. And you know what? I'll, I'll talk about this as well. Is I think, I think the only way to reboot or restart a civilization is through the unknown. And when things become unknown, when the future becomes increasingly murky and dark and you don't know what's going to happen anymore, people will naturally turn to religion. It is with religion that new new civilizations are booted. And I think that is why our civilization started with Christianity. Right? I don't mean historical events. I mean, uh, culturally speaking, our civilization, the Christian European star civilization started with Christianity, obviously. And so it will return to something like that. We are going to go back to an age of religiousness, of great spirituality, where people are going to have to find each other based on their on their instincts and their and their convictions and so on and not so much based on economic transactions that's what i'm trying to say we're going to have to do do without technology or we will no, we will no longer be able to rely on technology now i'm going to make a, a a bit of a comparison here between um oswald spengler and arnold toynbee toynbee like spengler also believed that history was cyclical, that civilizations come and go in cycles. Those um, Toyn B, so Spengler believed that it was uh, based on race, that races of people uh, are the ones who create history. Whereas Toyn B believed that it was religions. Religious religions create civilizations, right? And so Arnold Toynbee is a very famous historian, by the way, who also took on um, the matter of the Jews and Israel. But Toynbee, I just found out recently that Toynbee was also working in the British intelligence community. He was a British intelligence officer. And then I realized what Toynbee was doing is he was writing a universal history for all mankind based on Christian principles. So what he was trying to do is he was trying to get the whole world to adopt the Christian Western values. Uh, and you may believe that's a good thing or not, but the thing is, Toynbee was writing history in the service of the British Empire. You have to keep that in mind to understand what he was doing. So, what is really the foundation of civilization then? Is it race or civilization, uh, race or religion? Uh, I think it should be a com combination of both, probably. Don't both go hand in hand. So Toynbee and Spengler both essentially accepted that civilizations come and go and that they pass through certain stages, but the one believes it's race and the other believes it's religion. Uh, somebody asks if I'm a Christian. Yeah, it's a difficult question. I was baptized Roman Catholic, but I didn't go to church. And I did read the Bible now, but I'm much more of a philosopher. So I don't, I don't believe that there's an Odin sitting on a rock somewhere. I do believe that our people's mythology, like the Edda and the, you know, the Viking stories, our Germanic mythology is valuable. We shouldn't throw that away. It's very valuable to talk about Odin and Thor 
and perhaps alongside the sort of wisdom you can get from the Bible. Now, Old Testament Christianity, by the way, that's a really Jewish supremacist book, really, tells the Jews that they are superior, and you have to get circumcised. I'm not circumcised, you know. And, and the New Testament seems to be, have been tacked onto the Old Testament, right? And the New Testament gives the Jews their Messiah in the form of Christ, but the modern Jews, they reject Christ. And so you get all this, all this dynamic out of that. But I think uh, the principle of Christianity, you know, it serves the West. It can, it can serve our people. And I don't, like, like I said, if I think that our, the decline of Western civilization is going to go to, to a, a new period of religiousness, most people in the West will have to return to the Bible because we don't really have much else, right? Well, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, somebody says both Islam and Christianity serve the J, but it doesn't have to be this way. You can have an, a Europeanized Christendom. That's what they did in the 1930s in Germany, after all. They took Christianity and they began to Germanize it. They called it Deutsch Christentum or Germanized Christianity. They just, they just made it their own. So just like borders on a map, you can redraw them. You can take the book and you can reinterpret it. You know, isn't that the whole point? So, the obvious problem is that the Christian world today is in economic decline. If you, you know, Christian world is the West. We are being Africanized with mass immigration and culturally. Look at the United States. Whatever's happening there, I get the, get the feeling that Black Panthers have taken over. The, the click around Obama. I think Obama is the real president of the USA today, and he is being backed by the Black, Black Panthers and communists and Bolsheviks. And look at what they're doing. They're, this last year, American corporations hired only 6% of their new hires were white, white people, 94% non-whites. It's very obvious that the United States, in just 10 years from now, is not going to be a white Christian nation. It's going to be probably uh, a voodoo nation. So instead of becoming the global hegemon, as the United States would want to have been, I believe the, uh, the Anglo-American empire has already become the laughingstock of the world. Who's going to take that place seriously? Do you, do you think Chinese people, Asians, are going to listen to an Africanized USA? And we in Europe, are we going to take orders from black generals telling us to go to war with Iran? No. This is not going to happen. And the Afrocentrists, of course, are already rewriting British history, wanting you to believe that black people build Stonehenge. Come on. You know, if we're dealing with this kind of fraudulent rewriting of our history, I think it's time to, uh, you know, cut loose from a lot of things. So, as I mentioned, perhaps what we need to do is a sort of return to our, a mythology of our own. A, a mythology tied to our blood, to our people. A mythology that others cannot adapt. You see, I think this is the answer to globalism. Uh, instead of believing in a universal history and a universal religion for all mankind, we need our own people-specific religion, our own mythology, our own civilization that others wouldn't want to be a part of. Now, so I was talking about history and civilization, right? And so Toynbee says civilizations are, are start, Toynbee says civilizations are started by religions. Uh, Spengler said civilizations are started by races of people. And now we, ha we have here Professor Joseph Tainter, who wrote a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies, uh, published in 1988. He gives you dozens of examples where civilizations of the past have collapsed. And he did like a meta-analysis. He went to look at uh, what is the real cause of, a, of the collapse of a civilization, right? Are you just running out of steam? You just don't feel like it anymore? What is the reason that civilizations go down? Why they collapse? And according to Professor Joseph Tainter, the reason why civilizations collapse is internal, not external. And he says it has something to do with the law of diminishing returns. 
you know, in economics, if you're building a factory and you can expand your factory with new production halls, how many more production halls can you add to a factory until the factory stops making more profit? Maybe you can add, say, 11 factory halls and then you're, you have maximized the productive output of your factory. The same goes with civilization, says Joseph Tainter, but in terms of adding people. Imagine you would have more births in a society. Okay, you're adding more people, the economy can grow. You're adding more people, the economy can grow more, but not as much as the first time you added people. Now you add more people, the economy still grows a little bit, but not as much, not by not as much as what it grew before. And so at some point, adding more people to an economy no longer benefits the economy. By the way, I think this is the real reason why we're having mass immigration into the West, because the people coming into Europe and the USA today, they are only there because they are willing to accept smaller houses, live in a pod, eat bugs. They are willing to accept a far lower standard of life that is still higher compared with what, what they're from. Life for a Nigerian in a shanty town in the USA will still be better than life in Nigeria, but by far not as luxury, by far not as great as the life of the white people of the 1950s. Right? These people coming to the USA today, they're not going to have cars. They're not going to eat steak. They're going to have to eat bugs and live in a pod and, and use public transportation. But it will still be better for them than the life they left behind in India or in Africa. So that's the reason why we're seeing mass immigration. But at some point, you can't keep adding more people to an economy. There is uh, the law of diminishing returns dictates that there will be a point in time beyond which the economy stops growing. And I think we're headed for that. <clears throat> Oh, somebody sent me a heart. Okay. <laughs> Funny. So Joseph Tainter wrote about, as an example, right? There was a Mesoamerican civilization in what is now Mexico. Uh, and this is in the 7th century, 8th century AD. This is centuries before the Europeans arrived. But here's what happened. Uh, around the city of Teotihuacan. The city leaders had the ability to mobilize labor at an unprecedented level. For 600 years or more, 85 to 90 percent of the population of the eastern and northern valley of Mexico lived in or near the city of Teotihuacan. And about 700 AD, at a, around about 700 AD, Teotihuacan abruptly collapsed. The population dropped within 50 years to no more than a fourth of its peak level. A period of political fragmentation followed. Here you see that some civilizations that existed prior to Europeans' arrival in Latin America or Southern or uh, North America, they collapsed on their own. Europeans didn't kill them with diseases, right? They collapsed due to internal mismanagement, or in other words, uh, they maximized the economy and there was no other way to go but down. Uh, the same was true with the Roman Empire uh, around the time of King, the Germanic King Alaric when he sacked Rome. Rome had a million inhabitants still, and within 50 years, Rome lost about 99% of its population and dwindled down to just 20,000 inhabitants. And so the Roman Empire, <coughs> Tainter believed, collapsed because in the absence of fossil fuels, which the Romans didn't have access to, the society had to rely on slave labor, slave labor, but the increased cost and complexity of maintaining so many slaves, you know, diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism, eventually meant the controller class simply gave up. Meaning the managerial classes of, of Rome simply realized that it wasn't worth working for their society anymore and they simply quit. Isn't that what's happening in Western Europe? Oh, I have a breakdown. <clears throat> I'm back. Okay, I saw the live was breaking down. All right. Anyway, I think in the Western world, a lot of like productively, creatively successful people are simply... Oh, I have an unstable internet connection, so let me see. 
Still going, right? Okay. Well, anyway, so I think in the Western world today, a lot of successful people are just not going to invest their time in their society anymore because it doesn't really offer them what they want anymore. We, we can't really... If you are very creative and very productive, you know, uh, why would you still care about working for the Western world? You know, you probably wouldn't care anymore. So in the end, ancient Rome was simply abandoned. And, you know, first the wealthy people left. They would buy farms in the countryside. And in the end, people starved or ran back home or whatever they did. Rome collapsed. And this brings me almost to the final point of the stream. And then I'll go back to answering some of your questions. Uh, uh, so somebody asks here, do you have any book recommendations on these topics? Yeah, Joseph Tainter, The Collapse of Complex Societies. There's also a book called The Fates of Nations by Paul Colin Vaux. I'll type it into the comment section here, Paul Colin Vaux, so you know what to look for. And uh, yeah, books like that, go and find them. Now there's a, a woman called Gail Tverberg. She writes a blog called uh, Our Finite World. And she builds on this concept of Joseph Tainter that the reason civilizations collapse is, due, is internal due to the law of diminishing returns. And so she gives you tremendous, a tremendous number of examples. I think I won't have to go into this right now because uh, you know I've been speaking for about an hour now and I think uh, I'm gonna go to my conclusion here and then talk with the audience a bit more. And so you can go to the website ourfiniteworld.com by Gail Verberg and get an impression of how the extraction cost of oil is probably the reason why the Western world is going to collapse and why countries like India and China, whose energy footprint per capita is so much lower, uh, why they might survive a bit longer. Uh, okay, here's my closing insight. I believe that the Western peoples, like us, our people, will have to return to a race-based religion, right? a, a system, a civilization tied to our blood and our spirit, like right? mentally and physically, in a way so that we can separate ourselves from what globalism is doing, and we can choose our own path and pursue it independently from others, which means we'll have to keep our energy footprint low, probably, right? And I think this can be the answer, like our own racial mythology can be the answer to an anti-global, uh, can be the answer, namely, it will be our anti-globalist, anti-Islamic, anti-Afrocentric, anti, 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 anti uh, you know, new rebooted civilization. All right, we'll, we'll make ourselves separate from the Anglo-Americans as well. So the more our civilization's future becomes uncertain and unpredictable, the more people will naturally flock to mysticism and religion. And so uh, I think Spengler and Toynbee are right that, that civilization is cyclical. It won't last forever, right? And, you know, when the future becomes unknown and the unknown becomes a fertile breeding ground for one or more new people willing to take on the task of building a new civilization, you know, I think that's what we're going to do. And I think we should now already begin to prepare for the end and accept that Western civilization won't last forever, but that we can perhaps, uh, you know, start over and do something about something. Okay, so I've been speaking for about an hour now and I tried to do a one-hour podcast. I've spoken about a lot of things that may or may not have interested you. Uh, so let me have a look a little bit at the comment section if I want to answer some people's questions. So I answered the book here. Well, anyway, I hope I hope you are. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close off. You can go to my website www.jmk.info. And you can also go to my link tree. Uh, go to my go to my uh, TikTok profile. You'll have my link tree to all my other links where you can go to. Um, 
See you next time. Next week, 8 p.m., I'll come up with some new topic to discuss, and I hope it will be useful again. Thank you very much. I I'm just learning to get better at doing live streams. Eventually, I'll get the hang of it, and I'll be better at it, right? So give me some time to learn. It's a, it's a learning curve. Though. So thank you very much, and see you next time.